How we doing? Great. Great. Thank you. Okay. My name's Brian. So what we're going to talk about today is heart health. Uh, the fact that heart disease is very common, and we're going to talk about a signal that oftentimes precedes heart disease, and that would be uh, hypertension and ways that we can affect that score that we get with a blood pressure cuff. What we're going to talk about is multiple factors that have converged over the last many decades, really. I'm a self-rescue. Uh, I'm someone that was having some real troubles in this particular arena when it comes to hypertension and high cholesterol and a uh, body mass index that was not doing me any favors. Uh, so that's how I got involved in this realm. But I need to disclaim, I'm not a doctor or a dietitian. I do science outreach generally, and uh, I've got a broadcasting background. I'm the chronic diseases educator for Cochise County. Isometric hand grip exercises to lower blood pressure. Isometric just meaning you grab something and squeeze it. And you see the little gripper in the picture there on the screen. Uh, but behind there, tucked behind some of the words of the study, I've got a stack of washcloths in that picture because you can take a hand towel or a washcloth and roll it up and just squeeze onto it just at about one third power. So you're not trying to squeeze the life out of a washcloth for any reason. Um, the modality here that in 10 weeks in this study lowered blood pressure 10 and 5 points, 10 systolic, 5 diastolic. It's two minutes per hand, and you do three rounds. That's 12 minutes. But it's meant to be, I think it's meant to be done in the living room while the TV's on, frankly. <laughs> Here's a snapshot of where we are now in the U.S. as of uh, 2020, I think this was. Six in 10 adults have a chronic disease, a chronic disease. This includes 18 and up. So obviously these are often age-related diseases and this includes everyone who's fresh out of high school and in this 60% number of folks that have chronic diseases. That number is gone up over time. So what changed is the question there. Let's investigate that food. That's a factory making food and what happened over the course of a couple world wars is we had to get really good logistically at getting canned food out to foxholes in a couple three continents at a time for hundreds of thousands of soldiers for example and after doing that twice we got quite good at it at the logistics and the packaging and the mechanical operations but come 1945, unfortunately, the end of that second major conflict, needed to find new customers for that mechanization. And they did. The, the grocery store or the supermarket uh, was born. They came up with a new job called a food scientist. And I first heard about that, I was excited, like maybe somebody wanted to know about our nutritional well-being and whatnot, not, not at all. The food scientist is supposed to make these foods extra appealing, crispy outside and creamy inside and things like that. And, and whatever it would take, they would actually design what's called a super normal stimulus, which I want to explain to you what it is. It's a stimulus that has artificially exaggerated features of something that we are hardwired to respond to biologically. Such a stimulus triggers a stronger behavioral response than the original stimulus for which our response mechanism evolved. So we feel a mysterious, irresistible draw to such a stimulus. And just taking a quick peek at restaurant menu information, when it's available, when, it's, when you ask for it or go digging, some of the different things like uh, the, day, the amount of sodium in this one serving for one person is about three days worth of salt and that's for a half an hour, not 72 hours. So that's an incredible amount of sodium. Uh, the number of calories is probably 50 or 75% more than a person should have in the day. The, number of, the amount of saturated fat is probably in the order of four or five times higher than an individual would want in a day. And this is one sitting that you'll pay for in, in more ways than one, perhaps. So the next thing that changed is uh is the medicine aspect the better living through chemistry idea because the food started to change and people started to get more sick more often so then 
the medic the pharmaceutical industry needs to kind of chase after that and try to create some interventions. You know, 120 over 80 or below is what they want us to aim for. So obviously the effects of blood pressure medication on those numbers is that they would probably trend down pretty soon after going on a medication. Maybe they'd come down five or 10 points, which is what they would want to have happen. Blood pressure goes up when efficiency in circulation goes down for some reason, and there's a few normal causes. But when you're put on medication, which is oftentimes just thought of a bridge to changing other things, not necessarily, become more common that you might go on high blood pressure medication for decades. But it wasn't necessarily the idea when these, when these things were introduced. So what ends up happening, because your body's trillions of cells need oxygen and need nutrition, and what we're doing with blood pressure medication is just kind of turning the power down, almost kind of like getting off the gas pedal a little bit and lowering the RPMs in a way but that doesn't do anything about the circulatory inefficiency. So the trillions of cells throughout your body that needed this oxygen and the nutrients are just not getting that delivered. And that goes into kind of maybe a long-term scenario, not getting it delivered at the level that it would be preferable. But people do this even though their liver and kidneys, their filtering organs could get hurt over long periods on this medication. So is this an acceptable status quo? I don't feel it is. Do we look for a third thing? Do we keep on tweaking number two thing or we do go back do we go back to the number one thing? The fact that the food was changed, that's the path to solving this is going back to the actual problem. That's about a call it a 70, 75 year old problem when the food has been changed dramatically. The other interventions aren't working, but that, that might, well, that does, you could say, statistically and empirically. So how important is the food? Uh, how important is food and nutrition? I wanna double check this idea for this thesis here, for this theory. Well, the American Heart Association says a healthy diet and lifestyle are the keys to preventing and managing cardiovascular disease. The CDC says people with healthy eating patterns live longer, are at lower risk for serious health problems such as heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and obesity. And the National Kidney Foundation says good nutrition is the key to good mental and physical health. Cleveland Clinic says more than two-thirds of heart disease related deaths worldwide can be linked to food choices and that's a number that looks very much on the safe side i've seen that number posited as closer to 80 percent and this is succinct from dr david katz who is yale university's prevention research center coordinator diet is the single most important predictor of health family dynamics, being involved in the multiple generations of your family and community, not smoking, of course, uh, plant-heavy diet, constant moderate physical activity, not marathons or CrossFit or powerlifting, just like doing stuff a lot, like gardening and walking to the neighbors and walking home and walking to the little market because the, the store is like 150 feet away and that's how you get there is with your feet. Social engagement, uh, legumes, beans, chickpeas, things like that. Uh, uh, soy is oftentimes pops up in here. The Mediterranean diet is a lot different than what we're used to. Beans, nuts, legumes, and seeds are the main protein sources. Meat in the Mediterranean eating plan is a condiment rather than the main focus of the meal. They eat fish and seafood about two times a week, and less often poultry, eggs, and meat. Top sirloin, um, sirloin steak, the loin, like the pork loin, uh, the filet mignon is also a loin meat, low fat, and think of, again, smaller portions. So don't forget, Nuts and seeds count in there too as protein. Most adults need seven, five to seven ounces of protein a day. That's not a lot. How much protein are we getting in a day? 
Generally, most of us are getting a lot more than that. Protein is used to repair and replace tissue. We damage tissue in our body every day. Even if we didn't have cars that were producing uh, stuff that we're not supposed to breathe, there's dirt in the air, there's things like that. The sun. The sun. These things damage, just walking, damages the bottom of your feet, dry skin, there's all sorts of things. Protein is there to repair and replace tissue. One ounce of meat, poultry, fish, or seafood is one ounce, obviously. One quarter cup of cooked beans, so beans like the kidney beans, half an ounce of nuts and seeds, about three tablespoons, 12 almonds, seven walnuts, two tablespoons of hummus or other bean dip. One egg is one ounce of protein. If you only eat the egg, egg whites, you need the ounce and a half, the one and a half servings. If you're eating the yolks, you need three yolks for that serving of protein. One quarter cup of tofu, one half of a soy burger. Those are our serving sizes. Almonds, cannellini beans, chickpeas, also what we call garbanzo beans, cashews, fava beans, hazelnuts, kidney beans, lentils, pine nuts, pine nuts are so delicious and so expensive. <laughs> Pistachios, sesame seeds, split peas, tahini sauce. Tahini is sesame seed paste. All right, legumes. These are a class of plants that include beans, peas, and lentils. By the way, peanuts are also a legume. They're not actually a nut. Uh, common legumes are kidney beans, navy beans, pinto beans, black beans. Garbanzo beans are actually not a legume. They are classified under something else. But we call them all beans and they're all good for us. They're low in fat unless we add fat to them. They're high in fiber. One half cup of legumes is 6.2 to 9.6 grams of fiber. So let's talk about something that's not always so fun to talk about. Gas from eating beans. <laughs> Here's the thing, there are a few enzymes in beans that can cause gas, but mostly because we are not eating enough fiber in the United States, when we start to increase our fiber intake, the body's trying to adjust to that, so it increases our gas. The body will adjust. That will reduce. That Beano stuff really does work. Seafood, very popular protein source, of course. How, look how close they are to the ocean, all those countries around the Mediterranean Sea. M low in fat, good source of protein, low calories. They are high in omega-3 fatty acids. These are really important for us, for our blood vessels to be flexible. So when I say uh, our blood vessels flexible, even if we have a little clogging in our blood vessels, Vessels are flexible so that blood can still push through. So we're not having a higher um, blood pressure. And those that clogging can happen in our brain. All sorts of blood vessels to our brain. And if those get clogged, that's when we can see some cognitive decline. That's not the same thing as dementia. Cognitive decline from vas what they call vascular dementia is different than uh, Alzheimer's or some other forms of dementia. Herbs and spices, they are used so liberally in the Mediterranean. There are so many wonderful herbs from that area. Do you know the difference between an herb and a spice? Herb is the leaf, spice is the seed. There are some that we consider very much to be Mediterranean herbs. Basil, bay leaf, cumin, garlic, mint, parsley, pepper, sage, and uh, tarragon. Those are potentially more associated with Mediterranean food. Honey is a big deal. All kinds of honeys. Honey, the flavor of honey is based on what the bees are getting the pollen from. And it's time of year. So we have Lavender honey, uh, orange blossom honey is going to have a sort of a citrusy flavor. The lavender honey, you're going to smell it. 
carob syrup. Have you heard of carob? Mm -hmm. Yeah, carob is a chocolate substitute. So it's sort of got the flavor of chocolate. So for people who can't eat chocolate, carob is a substitute. They didn't have chocolate in the Mediterranean, but they have carob. So carob syrup is a sweet, chocolatey, sort of chocolatey flavored syrup. Grape must, very common in the Mediterranean. It's naturally sweet and can be used on a variety of baked goods, of foods from baked goods to a green salad.